This is Andy Osbaugh from Duke University School of Medicine. In this presentation, we are going to consider infections due to the Aspergillus group of fungi. Now, fungi primarily exist in either a round yeast-like form or a filamentous mold form. And we will focus on Aspergillus as the most common cause of mold infections in humans. These infections are exceedingly important to recognize because they can result in high mortality among our most immunosuppressed patients who are least able to fight off infection. Invasive fungal infections can also be quite difficult to diagnose, and they must be approached with a high index of suspicion in the right patient population. Therefore, our learning objectives for this presentation are first, to define patient factors that will predispose to aspergillus infections. Second, to discuss clinical features of invasive aspergillosis or how patients will actually present to medical attention. And third, we're, we will consider the ways that we diagnose and treat these infections. Now, like many fungi, aspergillus species are primarily environmental organisms growing throughout the world as saprophytes, or those organisms that break down organic matter. As can be seen in this picture of a steaming pile of compost, the temperatures here can reach 45 degrees, and fungi that are able to survive here would clearly be able to survive one of the major deterrents to microbial growth in humans, which is the 37 degree body temperature. Now, as mentioned previously, Aspergillus species grow primarily in a filamentous or mold form. However, they also produce fruiting bodies or conidiophores, as demonstrated in the photo on the slide. There are two reasons why this is important to recognize. First, the fruiting bodies are the sites of spore formation, and these airborne spores, or conidia, are the infectious forms of this fungus. Humans are exposed to numerous aspergillus conidia on a daily basis, inhaling them into both the upper and lower respiratory tracts. In most people, these spores are efficiently removed by our innate immune barriers, such as mucociliary clearance. Those few remaining spores that are um, that remain are killed by innate immune cells such as resident macrophages or neutrophils, as we will discuss further. The second reason why it's important to understand about these fruiting structures is that this is the way that the clinical microbiology lab will be able to specify which aspergillus species is growing in a particular culture. Just like botanists can tell different types of oak trees from variations in leaves and bark, a microbiologist will be able to distinguish among aspergillus species by the differences in the structure of the fruiting bodies. Aspergillus fumigatus, demonstrated on this slide, is the most common cause of human disease, and it's the most important species name for you to know. Other type of aspergillus, including aspergillus flavus, causes disease in corn and other plants, as well as being a less common human pathogen. Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus terius are uncommon but recognized causes of human disease. Knowing which species is growing from a culture may therefore help you determine the types of therapy perhaps to administer, or if the fungus is likely a true pathogen or merely a culture contaminant. Now, we are all so frequently exposed to numerous Aspergillus spores, why then is this disease not more commonly seen? After inhalation, in order to establish a foothold in the host, aspergillus spores undergo a process of initial swelling and germination, and they eventually form hyphae that can penetrate tissue and cause disease. As demonstrated in this histologic section of brain tissue infected with aspergillus fumigatus, the hyphae destroy the surrounding human tissue, invading and disrupting blood vessels, and that results in local ischemia and infarction. Now, interestingly, this uh, resulting poorly viable infected tissue is very difficult for immune cells and antifungal drugs to penetrate, further promoting fungal growth. Our innate immune barriers, such as intact skin and epithelial surfaces, as well as the resident innate phagocytes, all provide an effective first barrier against inhaled fungal spores, preventing germination and the beginning of fungal growth. The importance of neutrophil inhibi inhibition of aspergillus infections is underscored by the fact that invasive aspergillus occurs most frequently in patients with specific def defects in neutrophil function. Now, this includes absolute neutropenia, or low neutrophil counts, primarily due to cancer chemotherapy. Also, chronic granulomatous disease is a disorder in which the oxidative respiratory burst of neutrophils is impaired. Therefore, these phagocytic cells can engulf microbial invaders but they're not able to efficiently kill them. 
Patients with CGD are therefore at a high risk of aspergillosis. Interestingly, we do not see aspergillus infections commonly in our HIV-infected patients, even those with very low CD4 counts, since this condition primarily affects T-cell-mediated immunity as opposed to innate immunity. Now, the term aspergillosis defines a broad spectrum of clinical conditions uh, due to aspergillus species. The most dramatic of these is invasive aspergillosis. This disease, though potentially devastating, is an opportunistic infection occurring only in the most immunocompromised patients, as I mentioned previously. The CT scan on the right of this slide was taken of a patient with neutropenia who developed fevers, shortness of breath, and cough. In both lung fields, there are small nodules that were not seen on prior x-ray studies. This is a very typical initial presentation for patients with invasive aspergillosis. The disease typically begins in the lungs at the site of spore entry and presents with a very nonspecific group of respiratory symptoms. Without recognition and treatment, the disease can progress to extensively involve the lungs, potentially disseminating to other organs. The symptoms of disseminated disease will reflect the organs that are involved. For example, the most dreaded form is spread to the central nervous system, resulting in focal neurological signs or even altered levels of consciousness. In addition to invasive aspergillosis, this fungus can cause other clinical manifestations of disease, especially in less immunocompromised patients. For example, patients with chronic lung disease, especially emphysema, have altered lung architecture and enlarged alveolar spaces. People with the most severe form of this structural lung disease can develop a very chronic and indolent lung infection due to aspergillus species, what I refer to here as chronic minimally invasive aspergillosis. So, in contrast to the devastating and rapidly progressive lung infection we see in neutropenic patients, this condition is slowly progressive and rarely results in the death of the patient. The difference is that these patients have abnormal lungs, but normal immune cells that can inhibit the growth of the fungus once it begins to try to invade deeper structures. A third form of aspergillosis is the formation of a fungus ball or aspergilloma. This condition occurs in lung cavities such as those due to old tuberculosis infections. Again, in this region of anatomic abnormality, aspergillus can grow as a mass of fungal tissue as seen in the CT scan on the right of this slide. However, it does not typically invade the lung because of the intact immune defense. Although the fungus ball does not deeply invade, it can result in chest pain and hemoptysis or coughing up blood. The blood loss can be dramatic as the fungus ball disrupts and injures blood vessels in the surrounding lung tissue. Aspergillus species can also cause an allergic disease, most often seen in patients with severe form of asthma. Proliferating primarily in the abundant mucus found in the airways of asthmatics, aspergillus species can elicit an allergic lung condition called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or ABPA. These patients can experience worsening respiratory symptoms, including shortness of breath, cough, and wheezing due to the allergic response to fungal antigens. Again, tissue invasion by the fungus is minimal, and these patients are often treated with immune suppression, such as inhaled or systemic steroids, rather than with antifungal agents. Therefore, as we can see by these conditions, the host features are primarily determine whether aspergillus can actually persist in replicating inside the host, and if so, what type of disease uh, that it might cause. The disease can be either invasive, disseminated, or allergic. The most important point that I want you to remember about the diagnosis of aspergillosis is that it involves a high level of vigilance in the right patient population. This infection will not be encountered among most immunocompromised competent patients and will therefore not be a major consideration, for example, in otherwise healthy patients coming in with community-acquired pneumonia. Therefore, in the right patient, how do we make the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis? Most molds can only be infrequently cultured from the blood, but they can be visualized and cultured at the site of infection. This is typically accomplished by biopsy of infected tissue or by obtaining bronchoalveolar lavage or lung fluid obtained in the setting of pneumonia in an immunocompromised patient. 
In addition to histopathology and culture of infected tissue, fungal components such as galactomannan or various cell wall glucans can also be detected in the blood or the lung lavage fluid, providing an indirect means of diagnosis. Fungal serologies have limited use in diagnosing an acute infection. Now, seen on the right of the slide are some fungal features that will alert the clinician to the presence of aspergillosis. On the top panel is the presence of aspergillus uh, canidia that will be seen uh, when the fungus actually grows in culture. In the bottom panel is a histopathology um, section of tissue with the typical form of aspergillus. Seen here are uh, fungal hyphae with regular uh, dividers or septa along uh, the hyphal length, as well as acute angle branching of uh, the fungal hyphae. Various radiographic signs may also suggest the diagnosis. One of the most famous x-ray findings in invasive aspergillosis is what is referred to as the air crescent sign of the lungs. As demonstrated in this lung CT scan, the initial dense pneumonia seen in the top panel that is caused by pulmonary aspergillosis eventually forms a partial cavity as this dead and infected tissue is expectorated. Such an image would suggest the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis or some other necrotizing lung process. Once the diagnosis of aspergillus is made, treatment must be initiated. Now, whenever possible, one must consider if immunosuppression can be reversed or modified. For example, most neutropenic patients will only really recover from invasive aspergillosis when their neutrophils return during recovery from cancer chemotherapy or stem cell transplantation. Now, a limited number of antifungal agents have activity against aspergillus fumigatus. These agents include the mold active azoles, such as voriconazole, posiconazole, and itraconazole. These agents inhibit cell membrane ergosterol synthesis, and they are potent treatment options in this disease. Polyenes, such as amphotericin B, have broad antifungal activity and are along the best therapy available against aspergillus infections. Amphotericin B binds to and destabilizes ergosterol in the fungal cell membranes, so its target is similar to that of the azoles. Often this drug can be life-saving in invasive fungal diseases. However, it is only available in an intravenous form and it can cause many toxic side effects, including renal insufficiency. The echinocandin class of antifungals, such as caspofungin, mycofungin, and anigilofungin, also inhibits the growth of aspergillus species. These agents inhibit the enzyme that makes a key structural carbohydrate in the fungal cell wall, beta-1,3-glucan. Now, since cell walls are not present in mammals, these drugs have excellent safety profiles. However, some studies suggest that the echinocandins may not be as effective as the azoles or amphotericin B in treating invasive aspergillosis. Also, the treatment of this infection may require surgical debridement of infected tissue for complete cure of the infection. Now, invasive aspergillosis is often treated empirically uh, that means prior to the actual definitive diagnosis being made um, and at the first sign of potential disease in the right patient populations. Why is this? Well, this is mainly due to our, the imperfect means that we have to diagnose this infection quickly, as well as the high mortality of the disease if therapy is delayed. However, it's also very important to pursue a precise diagnosis because, as I've mentioned, many of these treatments are quite toxic, and physicians are unwilling to accept drug toxicity unless they know that they're treating a particularly serious infection. Now, even with all of these currently available diagnostic therapeutics and supportive care, the mortality of invasive aspergillosis is really bad. And in immunocompromised patients, um, it's at least 40% in most studies. Factors that favor survival include limited spread of disease, so diagnosing it early, rapid initiation of anti-aspergillus therapy, and recovery from immune suppression, such as the restoration of neutrophils after cancer chemotherapy. Now, the prevention of the infection is also important since this is so difficult to treat once the infection is established. Since aspergillus species are environmental organisms, 
It's important for immune-compromised patients to avoid exposure to these ubiqui ubiquitous spores as much as possible. So avoidance of construction sites and organic composts may decrease the number of spores inhaled. And some hospital units are specially designed with laminar flow and filtered air systems to limit environmental mold exposures among highly immunocompromised patients. So in conclusion, we've considered how specific patient factors predispose to the development of invasive infections due to environmental molds. We've also considered how different patient factors favor the establishment of different presentations of aspergillus infections, including invasive and rapidly fatal infections in immunocompromised patients, as well as less invasive or colonizing conditions. And lastly, we have studied the diagnostic strategies for invasive aspergillosis, emphasizing maintaining a high index of suspicion in the right setting. But once diagnosed, this infection should be rapidly treated with a combination of antifungal drugs, potentially surger surgery, and a reestablishment of immune function.